Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for attending our webinar today on Agile Portfolio Management in Action. Today's webinar will be led by Tom Raper, who is the Direct Director of Solutions here at Kaden. Before we get started, I want to thank those of you that were able to attend our session at PM Expo, which basically covered the concept of Agile Portfolio Management. Uh, this webinar today will build off of that and show how Kaden can help you actually apply Agile to your portfolio and to your teams. Um, a few housekeeping items here. Uh, this is a 45 minute webinar with a Q&A. Um, all phone lines are muted, so if you can hear me right now, your audio is working just fine. Please enter your questions and comments through the chat box. I will periodically be bringing them up to Tom throughout the webinar. And yes, this webinar is recorded and I will be sending out the slides and recording to all of you who have registered. Um, with that being said, Tom, do you want to get take it away? For sure, yeah, thanks. Thanks everybody for being with us all from your cozy homes or remote offices <laughs> in this day and age. Uh, so I'm a home office worker, but definitely uh, know there's lots of you that this is not the norm for you. So uh, welcome, welcome to this side of the fence where you're <laughs> working out of the house and some of the other distractions that come along with it. Uh, today's agenda. So we're going to go through some of the, the areas here around Agile Portfolio Management. Um, if you did, you, you attended the PM Expo, you, you maybe attended one of our sessions there, or, you, or you've just been kind of following the trends in the industry the, today, you find a lot of reference to this. Agile in general has been a pretty hot topic development space for quite some time, uh, but now we're seeing the, the same concepts or similar ideas coming into play from an agile portfolio management perspective. So uh, we're going to talk today about how we're, how we're tying some of those, um, what may have been traditional concepts in working on a development uh, type of environment, applying those back to project and portfolio management. Talk about some of the principles that are associated with that. So what are some of those elements that just make it up? Um, what makes it a little bit different than uh, your traditional normal project management or portfolio management type of world? We're going to talk to four key areas here within our solution, within the keyed in um, projects solution. And and I'm going to give you some uh, previews of that and get into uh, really some product demo uh, of the how Keydin addresses some of these things. So we'll talk to these four different areas and I'll show you different elements there. Likewise, um, you know, this isn't something that's maybe for everybody. So we definitely want to call out uh, things that you want to be aware of, things you want to be uh, cautious of or things that you just want to make sure that uh, maybe before you dive into it that you put a little forethought into things. Uh, and then likewise, uh, any key, uh, key takeaways that we have from this Q&A, as Courtney mentioned, um, please uh, feel free not to, not necessarily have to wait to the end of the session to ask your questions. Uh, she is, uh, is going to, if, if you ask the questions via that chat mechanism, she will bring them up to me throughout the process so uh, uh, I can answer them in line with anything that we've just talked about. Uh, a little background on me. Essentially, I'm in the, I've been in this project portfolio management space for quite some time. Time. Uh, first uh, had a company that I owned for many years where I was in professional services doing consulting work and we were doing a lot of um, project based management in, in our delivery of our consulting services and then I spent uh, 11 years or so with a, a competitor in the space to key in um, dealing with a similar technology and similar architecture and um, platforms and the like and been now with keyed in um, uh, going into my third year here with Keyed In and um, part of our solutions experience or customer experience team on the solutions consulting side of things. So first off, the need for, why do we even need this stuff, right? What is this whole agile portfolio management thing? You know, why is this potentially a buzzword out there that we even need to pay attention to? And, um, and really, even when we start to look at the uh, existing circumstances that we're all faced with, quite a bit of a distraction in our world today with all the COVID stuff happening and all of the uh, challenges that organizations are dealing with now to address how we're doing business, 
uh, potentially how we're engaging with our with our employees, how we're engaging with you know, our coworkers and the like. Um, so there's lots of different things that we're dealing with today that certainly make this a very topical discussion because really when we start to look at um, how we where we see these things coming into play that that first item there about you know making the wrong investments um, oftentimes you need to be able to pivot uh, with your with your different um, thought processes around you know we we had a strategy going into this year um, we were faced with some weird circumstances we we have a lot of different things happening in the in the environment today and so now we want to understand all right well how are we going to change this now to address potentially some of those variances or variables that came up that we weren't quite expecting so certainly we want to understand when we do start making investments in our organization, in our company, as we start to plan for which, what are those things we're going to do, we need to make sure we're making the right decisions there. We need to be able to keep up uh, and deliver faster potentially, right? So now all of a sudden we're faced with some changes we, we have to make and uh, being able to either spin up a project in a quicker fashion or be able to uh, take advantage of the fact that now we we need to go through what might have been a annual planning process for us or maybe a quarterly review all of a sudden now we're needing to do these things on a monthly or weekly basis so uh, if we're if we're not keeping up quickly then we'll, all of a sudden we're going to be starting to fall behind and now we're going to see ourselves struggling from some of those challenges and this last item here around just the urgency to create business value uh, really, you know, you look at traditional project management, it was about, you know, we were making sure that we were working on, at, you know, we understood what we were working on. We built out these project plans and they were, you know, fairly, uh, some of them could be lengthy in nature and it was all about defining all the requirements up front and looking at, at um, you know, just the, the most efficient way we could get through this. How could we define things so that we were uh, creating a, a, a plan that made sense, it was logical, it had some, you know, uh, um, immediate steps that followed each other, all of those things coming into play. Um, but now we've got to make sure that even COVID aside, really just even as organizations, right, as, uh, as we start to tr try to provide, especially if you're coming from a project management office, you're trying to not just uh, say, hey, here we are for the organization to deliver projects for you on time, on budget. But we want to make sure that what we are doing for the organization is providing value. So it's not really about how efficiently I can run a project. It's about the outcome that I deliver it uh, when I do start delivering my project. And it may not be something that I need to pay attention to what's the outcome at the end of this project, but what are the outcomes that I can deliver throughout the project so that there is value, a value stream that's being provided back to the organization uh, in a much quicker fashion. This is a, you know, if I didn't show you my other picture, I would have said, this is me you know, staring off with this glazing stare. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, you saw the other picture of me earlier. Uh, but oftentimes, I do sit there like this uh, with this, uh, you know, kind of uh, stare off into the distance and wondering what is the glorified, you know, is this just glorified agile pro for <laughs> project management that we're talking about? Uh, uh, and all kidding aside, yeah, I think, you know, when we start to look at this uh, agile project management, again, it's been, been around for quite some time, right? It's uh, um, dev teams have been doing this now many years uh, as far as focusing in on the fact that we're delivering these uh, agile based projects. We're not necessarily focusing on a whole, you know, start to finish end dates, etc. We've got um, these, you know, these little pieces that we try to take off and we, we look at these stories and points and initiatives and epics and things like that that we're trying to put together in small sprints and we, we try to do a little bit see how well that did and we, we carry that on um, well just like uh, you know agile project management may be delivering better and faster projects from an agile portfolio management we're talking about making sure that we're delivering the best projects so Again, we may have made some decisions on the fact that uh, 
these are the projects that we're going to be working on, but now we need to start to uh, make sure that, you know, maybe this month uh, is a different set of projects we should be working on than what we thought we were supposed to be working on last month or at the beginning of the quarter, we had the whole, everybody had in our intentions where we were heading with things. All of a sudden we're faced with a different challenge and now we need to regroup on this. Uh, and so being able to cycle through these decisions about projects that could be long in nature, we need to be able to uh, be willing to step back and take a, a quicker uh, pivot on those and say, okay, yeah, I know we started this, but uh, maybe we need to stop this and start something else or, or make a change in what our intentions were, what we were going to deliver out of that project. Likewise, people, certainly you do any of this work and people are associated to the, those efforts and in the agile pro project management space, you are typically trying to get your um, get your you know best people just associated to that project. Do I have somebody with the right skill set? Do I have the uh, somebody that's uh, has um, uh, potential availability or, or things like that where we start to just try to find the right person for that individual task. And in the agile portfolio management world, we're a little bit more focused on these teams that I've got a, a group of people where we are trying to make sure that we are not just thinking about, um, you know, what this and this person and that person, person A and person B might be individually needing to tackle as far as, far as addressing some of our uh, items that we want to get um, worked on, but also the fact that we may just need to go back to these teams and say, hey, look, this, this is a goal. We've got to get we've got to get uh, something delivered um, and I just need you guys all to work together. So we want to just plan for a team to essentially tie back to, to this work versus uh, trying to associate individuals or uh, getting down into the nitty gritty uh, of those individuals. So I'm gonna show you how we, we've made some changes in our solution to help better address team-based management. Likewise, then, when you start to look at these risks and you know, prioritizing and making sure that we're meeting that uh, uh, stakeholder satisfaction, in this agile portfolio management world, we are talking about more of a, a, prioritize, a prioritized backlog and um, making sure that it's not necessarily, you know, that every project fits one pattern or way of doing uh, our project operations. You are going to still have... Uh, you know, some of your projects that follow traditional waterfall PMBOK methodologies, uh, you're going to have uh, other other projects where you do, are trying to do a little bit more of a agile type of approach to them, some that are going to follow lean methodologies, etc. So you're going to see all of these different flavors coming into play. And it's important to just recognize that, you know, certainly not, not everything fits in one box and you can't necessarily force everything down a particular path or a particular process. You have to apply the best process to those different elements or the different ways that you need to, to get there. Tom, real quick, uh, you touched on it just a little bit there, but we did have mm -hmm. a question come through. Uh, does agile project does agile project management reduce more risk than wave or waterfall project management? Uh, I, no, I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say that. Yes, you, uh, that you're going to get less. Um, you're going to reduce the risk because you are doing. Um, one methodology over another. Risks are always something that you you never really know why those come into play, right? There, if it's you may be able to in an agile portfolio management concept, I may be able to uh, allow myself to pivot faster. I may, you know, I'm not necessarily going to force myself to get all the way through to the end of uh, you know, what we thought was going to be a completed task or a completed deliverable or something like that, right? I may not necessarily wait to a milestone before I make a change to address that risk. Um, so there may be some benefit there, but um, the fact that risks and issues are going to be prevalent regardless, uh, you know, I don't know that it's, uh, you know, I don't think there's any magic prescription there uh, for getting rid of uh, the fact that you're still going to have risks that come up or issues that come up. Um, you may be able to address them or deal with them a little quicker fashion if you're, if you're allowing yourself to be a little bit more flexible there. 
versus, you know, again, forcing yourself to say, all right, I know you've got a risk, but we're going to wait until we uh, at least, you know, get to, get this completed and then let's circle back on that, right? I think in this agile world, maybe you do say, oh, you know, here's a risk, um, you know, before we continue on, let's let's evaluate how do we address it, so. Perfect, thank you. Sure. I know everybody just wanted to stare at that guy a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so agile por uh, portfolio principles. So here we go. We, we've got you know these seven items that we've listed, just relevant to the fact that you know what these are some of those things that really tie into again why is this what makes this agile versus just uh, I don't know, portfolio management, project management, etc. So we we talk a lot about it keyed in. We talk about this and the the idea of what makes what makes project or portfolio management more agile in nature is this delivery the concept of delivering projects not or products not projects and really by that we we always kind of reference this in the fact that you know a traditional project you think of those things as being they've got start dates end dates they've got things we we do in some you know logical order they've got uh, you know something that we deliver we say okay all right here it is we've delivered it um and then maybe we go on to the next project well if we think about more of a product life cycle when you when you start to look at the way organizations bring products to market in most cases those products are never complete right they are something that i may come out with version one of my solution that i'm going to deliver to the marketplace and then all of a sudden you know there's there's even while we uh, we're getting ready to close out and deliver solution one out there we're already thinking about how we're going to address solution you know version two of that or uh, you know, the, the next iteration of this or the you know, how we're going to uh, bring the next product to market or whatever it may be from those standpoints. If you think of that product life cycle, it's really this continuous cycle of uh, I, may, I may give something to my customer base that provides some value, but I'm always thinking about, okay, what's going to be in the next, next iteration of that or how can I improve upon that or how can I replace that someday with a, a better uh, solution, right? So, so maybe this is the, the the first version of this we're going to bring and then we're going to change that going forward um, so when we start to think of this agile world and this agile portfolio management same concept coming into play and the fact that um, it, this is not a I, I put something out the door and then I'm just, you know, let it sit and, and I'm not coming back and always evaluating here. We're going, you know, now how do we continue to deliver value? So these projects and the life cycles that we're dealing with and the portfolio of projects that we have are this continuous cycle of where we're always looking at uh, how we keep addressing and bringing value to the customer, whether that's an internal customer or an external customer. Likewise, change it uh, like, like, other things in life, it will happen, right? And and so we have to be able to allow and embrace change from a standpoint of the fact that, uh, yeah, again, as we go into these things and, you know, where those traditional uh, project paths um, start to uh, fall apart a little bit is just the fact that you can have your best intentions going into something and you can have, you know, lots of good requirements to find. But uh, as you, as you, maybe start to get into it you realize there's there's going to be some tweaks we need to make and some changes that are, are associated with that so we need to make sure that we're embracing that and change along the way it, it will happen and not necessarily fight it and say no this is what we said we know we define good requirements we're just going to go with it regardless um being customer obsessed, that's certainly, you know, part of that, how, what drives that change, right? If, if, and especially if we start getting a little more iter iterative in the way we deliver these things, if I can provide a little bit of a piece, um, some value to my customer initially, and then turn around and, and get some feedback from them. Hey, how do you like it? Does it work? Are we on the right track? Uh, then that's really what allows us to then go back, make some quick changes, uh, address those things, uh, deal with those, you know, risks and issues as they come up, et cetera, you know, trying to make sure that it's not just about us, again, getting something complete, but that we're completing something that's of value. 
being a strategic partner, not a shared resource, there again, that's, you know, it's, it's also a two-way street, right? The, the, we, we expect the fact that uh, the organization that we're working for, if we're working on internal-based operations and projects, that we, as we deliver these things for those different business units, uh, we would also expect that they would be able to provide us decent feedback and candor and that we're, we're, we're not there just to uh, be minions for them <laughs> and deliver something or, you know, do some dirty work, but that we're also there to help them. And, and it's almost along those lines of, you know, help us help you kind of uh, thought process. Making quicker decisions. I've talked about that one a little bit already or quite a bit uh, in the fact that, uh, it, you know, being nimble in, and being iterative, iterative in the way you do these things. Uh, focusing on continuous improvement, that's you know, tied back almost into that, you know, some of that change and customer obsession up there, right? Being able to see there that we want to um, not just uh, maybe deliver something and, and know that, okay, that's, you know, that's the best it's going to get. But uh, after we've delivered it, getting that feedback, trying to understand and, and, and see, is there something that we could be doing to uh, enhance that or make it a little bit better or at least, you know, start gathering that feedback. And then as we've talked about, I think I mentioned this earlier, right? Not everything has to follow this concept, right? You're still going to have some things in your world uh, that follow traditional methodologies, traditional concepts, defining your core requirements and delivering on those, closing those projects out. And that may be all you need to do. So don't necessarily think that this is a all or nothing type of scenario. I'm sorry, okay. just a few questions yep. on that slide. Um, yep. The first one, does agile portfolio management apply to the user stories, features, or backlogs versus the entire project? Does agile portfolio apply to the, uh, say that one more time, the user yes. features? Yep, user stories, features, or backlogs versus the entire project. Uh, no, I would say yeah, it is is definitely part of the entire project, right? I mean, I, they think those that concept of uh, features, backlogs, um, those are those things that those attributes you start to capture along the way, and you may deliver some, and then you you've got a, a new set of features that you're not just trying to work out. Um, but they are going to be applicable throughout the life cycle. You may find even in your closeout stage, or even you know you get towards the end where you're truly going to, uh, you know, want to uh, finish a particular project that you've got now all of a sudden this backlog that that really kind of becomes one of those areas where maybe that is that next iteration, right? That continuous improvement where now you take that things that you didn't get done in this particular uh, portfolio project, right? And move it back into the next uh, iterate or next set of things that you're evaluating. Um, so I think, yeah, it, it definitely will apply throughout that. Perfect. Uh, and then how does agile project management respect budget management? Um, well, you, you, yeah, you can never, you can never avoid the budget, right? It is certainly something that uh, you need to keep the two coupled in, in some fashion, right? Because I do need to make sure that um, if I have to start addressing budget changes, you know, especially you look at some of the things like we're faced with now, all of a sudden, maybe there's not the revenue stream coming in our business that we thought was going to be coming in the month of March or uh, uh, those kind of things. So that definitely could be having an impact on the, on the budget side of things. And uh, that may then put more enforcement in this where we, where we look at um, now we need to go back and uh, either have some, financial values associated with those things that we were think we were going to be delivering. So that's part of a, maybe that process when we start to look at what we want to deliver. Uh, it's, it's not just about defining those features, but maybe associating those, those uh, you know, dollars and cents or those uh, financial values to it. So that way, when we do come back and we're faced with, all right, we know we've got to cut some budget it's not just about cutting features, but maybe we got to cut those features that have, you know, the appropriate uh, or, you know, that are tied back to a, a specific financial value as well. Right. So um, definitely a correlation there. I mean, I don't think we can, you know, you can't necessarily, I think I don't, if, if you're in an organization that's got unlimited budget, congrats. <laughs> I don't, 
<laughs> I don't think I met one yet. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, you know, unless you're one of the, uh, a startup organization and you're just getting a, a bunch of money shoveled to you and, and you know, there's not really a, a, a good, uh, mechanism for tracking how well you're spending then, um, which is kind of a rare instance these days. So I, I think that, uh, you definitely have to keep those two coupled and understand where the, uh, the impact of not doing something will, will have a financial impact as well. Perfect. And lastly, before we move on, do you see a diminishing role for traditional project managers as agile becomes increasingly prominent? How may they be rolled into an agile portfolio approach? Um, yeah, I don't think, yeah, traditional project managers, that was the first part of that. Just, you yep. know, how do they, yeah, I, you know, no, I don't think, um, I don't think they go away at all by any means. Um, I think you end up with a, um, you know, maybe a different thought process and in, in how they're leveraged. Uh, I think you, you still, uh, I mean, think of, you know, any scrum teams and things like that. There's still a scrum master, right? There still is somebody that's kind of trying to keep track of, uh, of the fact that, uh, not everybody's just, you know, doing their own thing, right? So we still need some guidance. We still need some direction. We still need somebody to over, overlook, uh, you know, how these things are all coming together, right? If, if everybody's just focused in on their little piece of the pie, then it, uh, it doesn't necessarily uh, help us with understanding the bigger picture of what's going on. So uh, I know I definitely think your traditional project managers are even more encompassing in that world. Perfect. Thanks so much. Good job, security for everybody. Okay, four key areas. So that's what I'm going to do fairly quickly, as quickly as I can here. I'm going to walk into uh, some different areas of, of our solution, how they kind of tie back to some of these things that we've talked about. So agile team resourcing, Kanban, as, as we see it tied back into or how we leverage it back into project portfolio management, uh, dashboards and reporting and prioritized backlog. So we're going to go through each of these and I'm going to kind of go back and forth here a little bit between product and uh, slides. So from an agile team resourcing, I mentioned this earlier, right? It, it is something that uh, you want to focus on getting those teams associated back to that work. Um, being able to uh, not necessarily have to get down into the nitty gritty of, of saying, hey, you know, I, I need to pick this person, that person, this, those other persons, being able to do some more bulk type of as, uh, associations of people to projects, uh, making sure that where you are not necessarily having to rely on uh, hourly tracking and the like, right? There's just the fact I can get these people associated to the project. I could uh, get some understanding of that they're busy with things and uh, really just then uh, start to understand better where our resources are tied across these different uh, activities and the like. So I'm jumping into our uh, Keydin solutions, uh, the Keydin projects application. Uh, and for this, I'm going to go into our resource plan and the resource plan is really all about trying to understand. I've, you know, I want to look across a, a group of people and see what, where they're busy with things, how they're tied bear, back to various activities. I have specifically focused in on a particular scrum team here, my Epsilon scrum team. Uh, and that incorporates these a few different individuals and I can see some just uh, availability or uh, utilization of these resources across various activities. And as I expand out and start to see where, where these resources are being tied back to either projects, maybe activities on a particular project, uh, Orville down here has got some time off, uh, so I can see where there's uh, just a, a basic association. These people are tied back into these projects, and one of the things we've recently introduced here was this idea of the fact that I want to associate this team back to another particular project. In my case, I've got this Dev Story Bravo that I want to uh, essentially request this team to be working on, and I'd love to take you know 50% of their availability that they have out there and I'm going to take that from the 12th and maybe up through just uh, let's go back into May let's go back into the May 9th and for right now um, what I'm showing you is just I'm just requesting the fact I'd like to use these resources so uh, within Keydam we've got this model of you can leverage the the concept of you know I'm putting in maybe as a project manager I'm putting in a, I'd like to use this team um, you can go straight into just saying, I, I own this team and I just want to go ahead and directly supply them to this. But I'm going to show you a little bit of a two-phased approach. First, I'm going to request them and then I'm going to 
uh, supply them to this. And, and this concept of provisional down here just says, you know, I, I'm earmarking them for it. I'm saying, yeah, I might need to use them. Um, I'd like to plan for them. I haven't committed to them just yet. Uh, and I just wanted to take, you know, uh, half of their remaining availability. So in doing this, what this does is this generates a forecast for us and a forecast record inside of keyed in is just helping me to see that uh, this is what I think is going to, based off of their availability, I know the capacity of those resources that we're working with and um, based off of this team that I'm, I'm, I'm associated with, I can see that, uh, you know, this week was blocked out. I didn't necessarily tie back anything to that week because of that was Orville's vacation. Uh, Catherine here had some uh, different uh, two weeks of uh, where she was already tied and 100% utilized, right? Uh, so in building this, uh, uh, this particular um, uh, potential, uh, maybe I'm going to tie this back into my sprint. Ooh. Fingers work. <laughs> I tie this back into my first sprint. That that's essentially what I want to uh, associate this group back to it. And and maybe I'll yeah, as the project manager, I'm I'm ready to go ahead and approve this. I could continue to save this as this forecast and continue to build this out. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and approve this now, just to streamline our process. Uh, and now when I start to look at this from a uh, maybe I am the resource manager associated with this. Now I can go back. I can see I've got this individual project, this particular team. I can see these requests coming in for their use. Uh, just like with that team supply type of concept, a new button in our world, right? We may have done this before with uh, selecting each individuals, et cetera. Uh, now here again, I can come in and say, yeah, I'm ready to go ahead and uh, supply this team back to those individual projects. I agree with these, these individual items themselves. Um, uh, I could make changes to these items here where I want to uh, maybe adjust or change what, it, what are those values. Uh, maybe I don't agree with the 50%. Maybe they can't be. Maybe I know that there's you know, multiple projects that are calling back into these resources. Multiple things coming back in, could come back into play here and in how I've de decided on my, the fact that I'm going to supply this group. Uh, I'll get a summary here of just the fact of what is the what is the allocations that we think we want to make with this group. So following back in line with what we have there, uh, I'll go ahead and supply that. And so now in just a couple quick steps there, I was able to essentially associate those resources back into these individual projects. And now when I start to look at these, I, I see the fact that they are associated back to the project as a whole. They're not tied back to specific tasks. Uh, I can see the impact on the overall utilization of some of these resources now as well. Um, so there's, there's um, just this uh, quick process here that we've created of being able to do more of these bulk or group type of concepts. And, and I'm showing you in this concept of more of an agile team or things like that that come into play. Um, but this certainly doesn't necessarily have to apply to that, right? You could be saying, hey, I, you know, I just need to uh, do this with my project management team or my trainer or any, any different roles that you have within the organization, the same concepts can come into play. So I reference it here in a little bit of a agile type of methodology or agile development type project, but this certainly can come into play in your traditional projects as well, where you just want to do these group or team-based uh, supply uh, to um, and request back to those, those different groups. Okay. Quick version of that. Uh, quick question. Yep, go ahead. A few questions here on the product. Um, one, can we manage permissions to restrict some actions? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I, yeah, I'm, I'm in there as a manager on both sides of the fence to do that quickly. So I am the, yeah, both the, uh, the person that maybe owns those projects and requesting those, you know, what I want to do with them. And I was also the person that could supply or, uh, or um, approve those requests as, as I did there. So uh, definitely, yeah, maybe a traditional world or maybe in your organization, you've got a more formal process there. So certainly that could have been restricted. Perfect. And then last, uh, or a few more here, as this appears to be an estimation for time, how does mm -hmm. that translate once moved from provision to actually using the team? Well, uh, you, you, so you're taking up you're taking up the availability of that resource, and 
um, it, it's still going to now, when I look back at the, how that comes back into uh, the, the individual resources or the, those projects themselves, if I take this item and I move it from a provisional to a confirmed, it's just going to allow me to um, enforce that that is now, you know, if I tried to supply them with, with additional um, time, then, in, you know, then, then it's something where I'm going to get more of this, you know, 100% allocation in there. Uh, there is a flag I didn't point it out here, right? But I, I, even in this window, I could just be saying, hey, I only want to see that stuff that's tied into uh, confirmed items, right? And that could have an impact on where we see now this, this true utilization of these resources and how they're tied back into things that are truly confirmed, right? Um, there's some, there's other variables that are coming in here to play as well. And the fact that we have something called, uh, productive capacity of our resources versus standard capacity. And that, you know, looks at the fact that even though a person may have a 40 hour work week, I may still only assume that, uh, you know, 75% of it is going to be tied back to project based work or things like that. So the, you know, multiple things that can come back into play to help us truly understand, are these people really tied back to those projects or not? Okay. Perfect. And the last one, I'm sorry, is does yep. the resource model use blended rates or actual rates to forecast the cost of the project request? Uh, either. Yeah. So you can do either one. Yep. That's an option for you. That's fairly quick answer. <laughs> yeah. you. you can either tie it back to, yeah, into individuals, the role, the type of person that they are, uh, or have it more of a, a blended rate. So yeah, multiple options there. Uh, next, we talked about the portfolio Kanban and workflow. So Kanban, again, you know, one of these traditional concepts can have been used in the development space for some while. You've got, you know, some board in, in your office somewhere that, uh, or maybe at your home now, that is uh, full of post-it notes and you've got these columns and lanes and things like that are tied back to it. Uh, really, that the, the idea of the Kanban is to help us understand where things are at in the process. How do we move something from one thing to the next? Uh, in, inside of uh, Keyed In itself, we have uh, introduced our portfolio Kanban. And what this allows me to see is not necessarily, I'm not looking at things from the individual project level. I'm looking at things at the higher level of this is a group of projects. So my tiles on my screen here represent projects uh, that I see that are going in uh, various phases of the, the project life cycle. So where we start to see where these things come into play and how they're tied back to the, the the different uh, places that they may exist within their uh, pro uh, project life cycles. Uh, and I certainly may have things where I am doing more, you know, traditional agile type of operations. I got very simple things. I'm just putting stuff from backlog into active, you know, as a project. Uh, maybe I've got things that are following still more traditional PMBOK methodology. Maybe I'm following uh, scaled agile, lean, et cetera. All of these variations could come into play where you start to define what are the ways that I want to see things moving through the, through the project lifecycle and see where things are at. Uh, and on top of that, where we, t where we look at this is we can put a little bit of, of process or still bring in some of those governance pieces coming into play here. Because if I am that project manager and I say, okay, yeah, I'm ready to go ahead and move this project into the planning phase, uh, I may have some checks and balances that I have behind the scenes that tell me, well, wait a minute, we're missing a key value that we need to make sure is associated to that record, right? So is there some piece of information that we didn't capture that, that really should um, if it, we did have it could allow us to move that into the planning phase or maybe once there's you know a, a particular value that has been entered it automatically moves from requirements into planning so I can automate these things as well and uh, and what those values are depending on the projects that I'm working with we we leverage this concept of project types inside of keyed in so different project types may have different pieces of information this one I'm very simplified I've got a a dozen fields or half a dozen fields here that I care about. And here when I say, okay, yeah, I'm ready to move this into the planning phase, just another way of, of 
um, having a button to do it versus that drag and drop that I was showing you a minute ago. In this case, uh, you know, again, I've got another validation that's coming into play that's saying, well, wait a minute, there hasn't been, you know, there's a budget on this, but it hasn't been approved or, um, you know, some of those other, other related records to this project, not just a field, but the fact that a budget record to us is like that forecast that we were looking at a minute ago. So that is something where I start to build out an estimate of, well, what do I think it's going to take to get this done? What's the level of effort? What are potentially the costs tied back to that? What are some of the expenses and other costs that we may see from a non-labor? That really represents that budget. And if I don't have that budget record uh, in there and or approved, right, then I shouldn't be able to move this thing forward. So this is a good example of where we're trying to take some of these, you know, Kanban type concept, very, um, um, you know, this, this view of where things are at within the different stages, how I have my various post-it notes here, uh, but I'm also applying some of that you know, traditional project governance in the mix. And I'm saying, well, you know, there's, there's still things I have to make sure that I'm, I'm covering for that. So um, definitely, uh, definitely very useful part of the solution helps you get into that business process associated with this, keeps you uh, more consistent in the way you maybe do your, uh, your various project operations, uh, and also takes away some of the subjectivity maybe, right? Because, hey, look, just, you know, I know you want to, I want, I know you want this to get started, but we're missing a key piece of information. So, um, that's, you know, also, uh, lots of things that can be done with this around what you're doing, what, the, what are those requirements? What are the, uh, the different ways you potentially move these things through? It's not a re requirement. You could still just have things move along, uh, and be able to see the visibility of it. Or you could look back at, uh, you know, are there, you know, specific notifications and things like that that need to go out. So, you know, when something's ready for approval, I need to send somebody an email, let them know that, Hey, you need to approve this. So, Lots more to this, uh, giving you the real quick version today. Uh, the backlog, certainly this backlog is, is always something. And here we're talking about not necessarily features and things like that to tie back into a particular project, but the fact that we've got project backlog, right? We've got things that we're trying to evaluate from uh, where are we at with the different projects we have uh, and how are we operating with those. So uh, from this perspective, it's, it is about how do we evaluate which projects we should be doing, which ones can we be doing, even if we have the money, do we have the people, uh, et cetera. So in this space, um, when we start to look at the keyed in solution, uh, it is something that uh, we incorporate our uh, portfolio analysis into the mix. And what we may uh, look at is the fact that uh, we may have a backlog that is just based off of the fact that we've got different project requests. So we can take advantage of the same Kanban type of methodology to see where as we bring new um, uh, uh, projects into the mix, they, they may need to go down some approval path and some review process before we know which uh, other workflow or other uh, path they may be going down. So this is maybe my precursor to even making it into that other workflow that I was just showing you is the fact that I want to build out some concepts. Here's some things we want to be doing, some things we're evaluating. Again, those same checks and balances can come into play. You know, if, it's, if a project is a certain amount, then I'm going to require a business case. If it's not, then we'll go ahead and allow it to just be approved. Uh, you know, if it's less than 25,000, go ahead and let it get, you know, approved automatically. Um, all of those things, as we capture them, they may roll back into more of a, a dashboard here where we want to see, is there the, uh, you know, a, an understanding of these are the things we're considering and what we're evaluating and how we can kind of look at these side by side. So all of these details that we've captured, maybe pieces of information that we captured on those projects, some of those fields that I, you know, popped up in that little dialogue box a minute ago. And based off of some of the fields we capture, we could go ahead and do some fun things in there where we start to calculate scores based off of the, the values that people are are selecting or putting in there, right? So um, helping us to get this visibility into here's a lot of stuff that we want to be doing uh, and how those things line up. How do they uh, associate with each other and something like these bubble charts down there and seeing the fact that I've got, you know, these um, uh, this particular strategic project over here that's a huge cost, a big big cost um, and uh, but it scored the highest uh, it may have also have the biggest amount of effort associated with it right um, and in being able to do these comparisons understand what we're dealing with 
taking that one step further, our portfolio analysis allows us to take a group of things like this, where now we can, I've created this scenario, bringing in some of these strategic things. I've also incorporated maybe even some projects that we already have underway. Um, so this isn't just about looking at our you know, annual planning for next year or how do we look at what's going on out there, but also incorporating maybe some of these projects that are in here that we've already approved and we're, maybe we're already working on them as well. Um, and, and we can see in, you know, another quick snapshot here in a summary, a summary of, well, this is what it's gonna cost us based off of the cost in those projects. This is the amount of effort that may be tied back to that. Uh, but also then looking at that from a capacity perspective and saying, okay, well, if we did all that, would we have the right bodies and people and everything else tied back to this? We're going to have some challenges with some of our, some of our resources out there, right? Are we going to be able to uh, deal with some of the things that are there, right? So maybe we want to go back and now start playing with this. And this is the area of our solution where we get into some of that what if type of analysis where we can say, okay, I'm going to take out these two real low scoring items. Uh, we've just decided, you know, as a group that that's uh, not applicable for us right now. And when I start to look at this, maybe this finance app update uh, project, it hasn't quite started yet. It was supposed to be starting in June, but based off of everything else that's going on, we're going to need to push this out to September timeframe, right? So uh, with that, now, you know, let me go back and take a look at my capacity view and see, okay, well, you know, not quite as much red out there. I still got some testing uh, issues here that uh, maybe I either, you know, not too terrible there. I can look at maybe bringing in a contractor with that. Uh, maybe we can look at evaluating somebody because this is out in September. Maybe we'll bring on a part-time resource. Uh, being able to kind of flip back and forth between these two, right? Seeing the impact of these scenarios that we're creating. And then likewise, maybe even being able able to do a, a comparison of these two scenarios and be able to see, you know, well, what, you know, what are some of those uh, subtle differences between those two variations or what's the impact, right? Bringing those things back into more of a now a summarized view and some reports and dashboards that we care about here to help us uh, compare those two scenarios and how things are made up, how our, our resources are impact, how, uh, you know, some of the things we're looking at from a, a cost perspective, et cetera. Um, uh, just uh, this, this quick concept here, give again, quick version based off of time of uh, where these things are, are tied back into the, the uh, understanding how we're addressing some of those things that are out there, right? And, and also incorporating the fact that uh, uh, in this mix, uh, if I go back here just real fast, the fact that as I look at this particular you know, capacity view, right now this is based off of those projects that I selected but also being able to do this, hey, tell me about everything, even if I didn't put it in that list, right? I need to make sure that I understand what's going on with the people that are out there. Aha, yeah, even bigger picture, bigger issues that come into play, right? So if I truly incorporate uh, the other work that was outside of the, um, where we you know, had those, some of those same types of resources associated to other operations, uh, even though I forgot to include them in that mix of things that I had there. Uh, and still being able to now take that into consideration, still not quite so bad if we did some of those changes that we, that we evaluated there, right? So. And Tom, okay. while you're in the tool, yep. um, we have a question here. Can the Kanban be customized to a specific hybrid gate and life cycle? And then yes. also, is there a timeline view of the portfolio? I understand if you want to go one at a time. Uh, yes. So yeah, you definitely can in the Kanban side of things. Yes, you can, you can, you, those lanes, what represents that life cycle, it is up to you to define those, you know, what, 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 what works for you. We provide several out of the box template kind of variations for you, but, uh, certainly most organizations will go in there and define what's, what's applicable to your organization and based off of the different project types you may have, again, different project types, different paths, they may go down. Um, and the other was a timeline of view associated with the portfolios. Yep. So often, is there a timeline view of the portfolio? Yeah. So oftentimes we'll do that we'll, uh, with what we call project insights in Keydin. And so that may be something where we want to see 
uh, all of those projects that fall under a particular portfolio. Uh, and that's really just allowing us to say, hey, uh, am I, am I, is there some attribute of those projects that makes them a portfolio? There's logical groupings you can do of these things, that there's some logical structure to this, but portfolio uh, insight or the insights functionality inside of keyed in does allow us to say, hey, you know, I want to see all of those that are the infrastructure related projects, right? That's a portfolio to us or all of those that, you know, fall back to a particular product line that we may have. Uh, when I click on that insights, what that allows me to do then is quickly see the fact that, all right, well, here's some of the details about all of those, that particular group of projects. Uh, and one of those is a, a timeline type of view. So where we um, where we talk to just being able to see how the, some of these projects overlap. And if we wanna go one layer deeper from there, then we, we can look at what we call our deliverables or more of those higher level milestone type activities that are tied back into the that particular group of projects, right? So uh, a couple of different ways that we can start to understand uh, what's going on across these particular projects and groupings. Okay. All right. I'm looking at my clock. I'm past my time a little bit, aren't I? So dashboarding reporting quickly. Wanted to get into this uh, just from a perspective of um, the fact that, you know, you put all this information, you, you put these records into the system and you need to make sure that you're getting those, those things out of there and how do you define, you know, what's appropriate to, you know, how do you make better decisions based off of those dashboards and the like. Um, so certainly there's things within keyed in that we provide, you know, different ways for you to create views like this. This is an example of a view that you can get in there and you can say, well, that's not what I would want, right? I mean, I want to have different objects on those screens uh, in this insights type of functionality. There's also an area that we call just dashboards, right? Where we want to create a particular um, APM application or agile portfolio management, not application portfolio management. Uh, dashboard where just the fact that now I want to in this dashboard I want to incorporate a few different you know elements that are going to make help me make some of these decisions right so uh, I have a number of reports and things like that that are available uh, and I want to understand you know where are we at with these particular items um, I'm going to bring in a what was the one I wanted to bring in here uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Demand by project role, we'll bring that guy into play. And you know, this is kind of some of these ideas where we just want to incorporate, uh, you know, how is it uh, simple for users or your team to uh, bring those things in into this mix that are gonna be most important to you. Uh, maybe along with this, I am gonna need a risk register because that's gonna be, you know, part of that risk process that we talked about. Uh, and maybe even just I want to understand what are some of those things that are out there that we have uh, uh, maybe the oh where did I put it uh, unallocated demand certainly something that could come into play here so where we know that we have uh, project demand for resources but we haven't necessarily tied back to that. Uh, and then likewise, I think two more that I just wanted to point out here, the fact that we've got uh, critical deliverables that are in the mix, right? So some of those deliverables, some of those high level things that we want to keep an eye on, uh, we wanna make sure that we're at least focusing on the critical ones and uh, probably because, you know, finances are part of this mix as well, we want to understand the, uh, what was the budget portfolio? Where did I hide it? Mm -hmm. All right, come on now. Aha, there, that's the one I wanted, budget versus actual buy. Okay, so quick, you know, few click type of scenario here where I've been able to create a, a quick dashboard, help me make some of these decisions that we've been talking about, right? Being able to bring some of these things into the mix where I'm now understanding uh, different pieces, you know, all of these different records that are making up some of the, the detail behind the scenes here, things from projects and how those 
roll up into programs, uh, the financial pieces that are tied back to them, some of those key deliverables that we want to keep an eye on, are they overdue or not, those risks that we wanted to focus in on as far as the risk registers that were essentially being tied back to you know some of the challenges that we're faced with, et cetera. And all of these things really being an area where you know, there's there's a number of these that we're providing out of the box, but you may want to get into these and you may want to say, well, yeah, but I want to highlight some stuff, right? I want to make some changes to those. So making changes to reports, a fairly intuitive type of uh, concept here and saying the fact that, all right, in this one, I want to make sure that I, you know, I highlight those things where are um, the, the, on these risks that are, uh, let's see, let's create a quick rule. The fact that the uh, impact date is something that is within the next 30 days, right? So I can do this by the fact that I can say, well, everything, you know, anything that is impacted, there's an impact date value on my particular risk record. If that's within the next 30 days, then I want to make sure that I've applied this, you know, red formatting to the, the labels that are there, right? So some quick conditional formatting here that I'm showing you, but the whole concept again being the fact that now I want these things to stand out and understand what's going on with those, right? So I did something wrong there because I didn't. <laughs> did uh, highlight that okay okay last thing around dashboarding and reporting uh is the fact that um in this environment we've also partnered with this organization called cast and they have a solution called highlight and this this more specifically gets back into some of the development type of world but this really just um what they do from an application perspective allows you to dig into the code that you're working with on your different uh, maybe uh, products or solutions you're developing and we're, we're we're creating some correlations with what's going on inside of keyed in with what's happening inside of your code or software development world and so this we're creating a nice relationship with these guys as a partner of ours, um, their solution, this is the, a, a view into their tool set, looks at uh, your different applications across these different uh, aspects and starts to tell you based off of the best practices and things that are known based off of controls you may be using and how you're coding things, et cetera. Is it something that is easy for somebody to understand, somebody, another developer to get in there and work with? Is it cloud ready? Is it something that is uh, has some resiliency based off the fact that it's you know not vulnerable to uh, different code um, uh, maybe uh, security related concepts and things uh, and you dig into some of these things and you can dive into you know a particular piece of the of your application or a specific application and start to understand are there components built into that application and so they're doing a whole lot of uh, a behind the scenes analysis of the code that you're that you're developing uh, and then giving you lots of information to help you address some of those challenges. So we're seeing a number of our customers that have that as part of their life cycle, right? They've got some of their projects that are very dev based and, uh, and we've seen the, you know, the, the wonderful things that this organization can do with their tool set and how that's coming into play. So we've got a good relationship where we're starting to create this connectivity between our two systems into uh, helping organizations bring that visibility into the mix. Okay. I've been talking too long. Um, really, uh, a little bit of a quick summary here, just the fact that the, you know, what we look at from an organization, we want to help you make, you know, the, those right decisions. Are, are you focusing in on the right projects and the right things that you're dealing with? Are you, are you needing to be more nimble with uh, how you can turn quickly there and the fact that uh, making, taking advantage of understanding, yep, we've got some challenges out there. We've got changes we need to make. We've got uh, maybe uh, just highlighting some things in those dashboards and like, right, bringing something to the surface that may have been uh, something a little bit harder to dig into before or not making it quite easily it's accessible and that helps me make a decision and then likewise maybe make changes on how I'm delivering those things right being able to pivot what we're providing or or making um, just the fact that we're not necessarily waiting wait until the end of a uh, you know product life cycle to say okay business here you go we want to you know bring some of these things to fruition sooner than later providing that value quicker if you're, how do I know your organization's ready? Well, I mean, you're, you're doing some kind of value-based scoring. These are some of the elements that kind of tie back into this. Is this appropriate to your world? Um, you know, based off of time, I'm all also reference the fact that, you know, there's a, 
uh, another recording if you're interested we can give you that gets back into some more of the details behind this so if, if, if what we've said today piques your interest a little bit more then we've got a couple of other sessions that we've done recently as well where we can get you some of those recordings and uh, be sure to you know put your name in the chat or you know follow up with us uh, off of the um, uh, how you we, we got in contact with you via the registration to get some more understanding of you know is if if you're trying if you think you're partially there maybe you don't know that you're there and you want to just you know help understand you know will this will this benefit your organization you may fall into some of these categories right um, you're able to do a little bit more of a um, you know the, the fact that you're focusing on these uh, more agile type concepts within your organization. Uh, we mentioned this earlier, the fact that it's not for everybody, right? They, there are some things that you need to make sure that you're, you're still taken in, into consideration and it's uh, still not an excuse not to plan, right? I mean, the plan, you still have to plan for these things. We Maybe we just plan in shorter iterations or we, or we start to look at how quickly we make changes to some of those plans. We don't have to say, hold our ground and say, nope, that's what we plan for. That's what the requirements said. That's all we're going to do. Um, it, it, it's something that this third bullet point here, right? We, if it's something that's a, um, uh, it, it could be, you, you do want to be cautious of the fact that don't do it just because it's a popular thing to do and don't do it because it's something that, uh, uh, you know, maybe your, your, uh, somebody else, you know, in the industry is doing it as well. If it's, it, you do have to be aware of the fact that it may change the way you're doing things and it may cause a little bit of a ripple and may, and so we want to make sure that you, you apply it appropriately and maybe ease into it, right? Uh, certainly you can work along the way. Uh, it's, it's not just the, the only way you can do things. And we make sure from an application perspective that that's, you know, we're not just forcing everybody to go down this agile portfolio management. We still have all that traditional project portfolio management built into our solution set. So this key takeaways uh, covers back some of the things that I've talked about and I have blabbed on too long. Don't worry, it's because we answered some really good questions diligently. Um, <laughs> hey, a, little bit, a little bit more about Keaton here. I am going to launch a poll click just in case any of you out there are interested in seeing a more detailed version of Keaton uh, directly with time. So feel free to fill that out while I just go over a little bit of what Keaton is. Um, we uh, were founded in 2011 by the former CEO and head of sales at Epicor Software, George and Lori Klaus. Um, their vision was to create the next generation of enterprise business systems developed on the latest cloud technology. Um, although it may seem like our company is fairly new, our product has been around for 25 plus years serving the PPM space. We are headquartered in Minneapolis, Minnesota with an office across the pond in the UK and also one in San Francisco, California. Uh, we do serve 500 plus global customers with a million users and an NPS score of nine out of 10. We are a Gartner recommended software solution um, and we won the Gartner Peer Insights Customer Choice Award in 2019. And below you can just see some of uh, a few of our clients and what Keaton has done for their particular business case. With that being said, if there are no more questions coming through the chat. I will give another minute or so here to fill out um, the poll. Thank you to those of you that have already taken it. Okie doke. Yeah, so well, I thank everybody for joining us today. If, if there is a last minute chat question coming in, we will capture those and make sure we'll reach out to you directly as well. And uh, as Courtney mentioned earlier, then you will all get a, a reference to the fact of the recording of today's session, uh, along with uh, some of the PowerPoint content that we've talked through today. Anything else from you, Courtney? Nope, just a couple comments on great stuff and good information. So I think that we can um, end that there. Okay, great. Thanks everybody. Have a great weekend. Stay safe. Thanks so much, everyone.